help me, Doc, you all right? This bloke's my friend and he's going to talk to you about own time travel in my own town of Nottinghamshire. So listen up, because we have got some good things around here to see, you know. Oh, and by the way, chip cobs are brilliant. And if you call him a bread cake, you're wrong. OK, me Doc, see you later. Bye. Hello, and thank you for downloading. You're listening to Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure, a weekly series looking at unfamiliar places across the world, an aspect of travelling you may never have thought of. I'm your host, Ian Oliver, also known as the Barefoot Backpacker, a middle-aged Brit with a passion for offbeat travel, history, culture, and the whys behind travel itself. So join me as we venture Beyond the Brochure. mid-June. And as I look out my bedroom window this time, I see summer might well finally be here. It's warm, the sky's mostly quite blue, and it's dry. Now, I'll concede that the recent rains we've had may have made my front and backyard fill with weeds and other random green plants that I've absolutely now no idea what they are, and I feel I ought to do something about them at some point before they take over. My backyard in particular is fond of growing nettles, uh, it's a shame I'm not overly fond of tea, otherwise I may well have found a use for them. But as it is, it means I've got to wear walking boots to do gardening. Believe me, you don't want to walk over nettles barefoot. And to think, one of the reasons I bought the house I did was because it doesn't have a garden. And I just don't do gardening. Maybe I should go with artificial turf. What do you think? Actually, and to be fair, I ought to get on with some tidying, especially of the yards as I have someone due to rent my house in a week and a half's time. Actually, by the time you hear this, she should be well in position. I mean, she's a friend of mine who's lived here before, and therefore I didn't feel the need to truly improve the place. It might help if she can let her dogs out in the yard without worrying they'll be attacked by triffids, though, you know? It's quite a nice area I live in. It's um, semi-rural, you might say. It never used to be thus. Fifty years ago, this was all coal mines and railways. But now it's country parks and footpaths. It's a pretty good place to go walking, or running even, if you have the inclination. My usual run involves a couple of steep hills, so your mileage may vary, as they say. And whichever way you go, you can probably find a decent pub to refresh yourself before the journey back home. And this, this leads me on to today's pod topic, not beer. Interestingly, it is something I plan on talking about in a few episodes' time, beer around the world. Mm. Rather, today's pod will be on hometown travel, and the joys of exploring places local to you. As you can probably tell, I'm British. One of my ambitions, and I'll be talking about bucket lists in an upcoming pod, is to visit every county in the country, where county refers to administrative units. The definition is quite complex and inclusive because nothing's ever simple here in the UK, but there's eh, 267 of them at the moment. They keep creating the bloody things. Many of them are rather small. The reason for this is a combination of two factors. Firstly, I believe that everywhere is interesting. See, many Twitter travel chats have questions along the lines of what's the best place to eat in your hometown? And if a tourist came to your hometown, what would you take them to see? The trouble with that is, um, well, it assumes that you live somewhere large and notable enough for tourists to be visiting anyway. And obviously many people do, of course, but even here. Uh, touristy areas only account for a small part of the urban area. For example, another of my future parts will be dedicated to talking about London, but not necessarily the bits people would have thought of. But equally, many people live in the provinces, regional cities with maybe one or two stimulating attractions, or one of the myriad of small towns where nothing much happens at all, and the only tourists who come here are very lost indeed. Yet, these places exist for a reason. People don't live in a vacuum, otherwise they'd die. Hmm, physics joke. This is why I pod and I'm not a stand-up comedian. I always feel there must be something that's driven people here, either historically or contemporarily. Is that the word? It is now. And it's that that I always want to find out. It could be that the town was at the best place to cross a river, Newcastle-upon-Tyne in England. Or it was an ancient frontier fort or trading post, Utrecht in Netherlands. 
or people came here because of mineral resource, a whole series of mining towns across the world, including the one I live in, or because of trade and manufacturing, crew in England was built for the railways, or even for pleasure, Sofia in Bulgaria and Bath in England, amongst others, were founded as spa resorts. And of course, it's not just a town's origin that makes a place notable. It may have been the site of a major political event or treaty, for example, the village of Schengen in Luxembourg, or the birthplace of someone significant. Although an important military town in its own right, most tourists seem to visit Gori in the country of Georgia, as it's the birthplace of Joseph Stalin. Or it's the scene of a battle, being British, obviously I've got to say the towns of Hastings and Battle, but also Market Bosworth, two very significant battles in English history. It may have even been the site of a world's first. For example, the first passenger railway in the world was in Wales, on Mumbles, itself interesting as being one of the many places named after Brests, CF Manchester. Making the city of Swansea the first to have a railway station it was called the Mount, it's near today's museum and nothing remains. I mean, granted it bore no resemblance to modern railways, it was hauled by horses and felt more like a tramway, and the original passenger service didn't last that long, but still it was the first. And of course, what makes a place interesting depends entirely on you, not on other people. If you have a passion for, say, fantasy literature, then you'll find excitement in Oxford, remote Scottish railway viaducts and the suburbs of Birmingham. You like football, then Statue Spot in Middlesbrough, Trafford, or visit Sheffield FC, the oldest club in the world. Or maybe you prefer social and political history. Take a walk up Kinder Scout in the steps of the mass trespass of 1932 that led to the adaptation of the Rights of Way. Or visit St Peter's Square in Manchester to stand on the spot of the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, the event that kick-started radical political reform in the UK. There's something everywhere that's notable, if you look hard enough. The other reason I want to visit every county, blah, 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 in the UK is because of a tendency that we all, especially travel bloggers, fall into. We like to visit places far away because we think they're spectacular and exotic, yet dismiss or even forget what's on our own doorstep. There also seems to be a theme for people to count countries, a topic I'll talk more about when I do talk about bucket lists, which is fine, but again it means people concentrate on other places rather than their home. And because something is familiar, we tend not to think of it, or we think, oh, I'll go there someday, it's easy, I don't need to plan it, but of course tomorrow never comes. I lived within walking distance of Cadbury World in Birmingham for seven years and never went until I moved away to Nottinghamshire. Chocolate, what's not to like? While it's true to, to find the very spectacular this first chance you will have to leave your country, with the possible exception of the USA, a country with pretty much everything you could think of worth seeing and then more besides, you certainly don't need to go around the world to find local equivalents. The UK doesn't have high mountains but it does have some very remote and beautiful scenery that's just as intrepid to hike through. Scotland, obviously, but also South Wales, and even places like the Pennines and the Peak District. There's also plenty of waterfalls, lakes and forests to explore. Most countries will have similar, and possibly even better. France has the Vosges and the massive Centrale, if you don't fancy scaling peaks too high. Australia has the Snowy Mountains and the Blue Mountains, the latter preventing the expansion of the early colony for many years. What about culture? Eating foreign foods, hearing music, getting the vibe. Well, if you feel India is too far from the UK, take a trip to Birmingham, walk down Stratford Road in Spark Hill or Brick Lane in London. Eat the food, buy the cloth, watch the movies. Fancy some African music? Apart from, obviously, the huge scene in Paris with Senegalese and Maghrebian influences, remember that Lethal Bizzle and Tinchy Strider, both notable musicians, amongst other things, are anglo ghanaian You don't have to go far to find something different. I asked a few people, a few friends of mine online, how they felt about hometown travel and what was interesting about the places they lived in and this is what they said i live in a small market town in the northwest of england and although we don't have the general tourist stuff there's no museums or anything like that it is what it is but we have saxon crosses in the square we've got a maker's market and a local market too there's canals nearby there's stuff to do if you just look for it so enjoying my own hometown. Uh, I was reading a tweet just yesterday. Someone was talking about black squirrels in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I actually get black squirrels in my own back garden in Hitchin, Hertfordshire, uh, which is a small market town just 30 miles north of London. Uh, also in the same Twitter session, uh, a travel blogger friend of mine was talking about the lavender fields in Provence, France. Um, we've actually got some of those as well uh, in a small village called Ickleford. Uh, which is just two miles north of Hitchin. Uh, and last year we had like lots and lots of tourists uh, from as far afield as China visiting. 
uh, somewhere that I can actually walk to myself. So that was Nat from Nutpacker Travel and Steve Biggs from Bigsy Travels there talking about their hometowns. Neither of them particularly big metropolises. One person who does live in a large city is Amanda Kendall from notaballerina.com and she's recently been through a reappraisal of her hometown, looking at it in a new light. I've actually always felt kind of negative about my hometown and sometimes I think that's because it's it's really far away, it's the most isolated city in the world and it until recently was kind of a boring place but really I think it's just my mindset and my attitude because it's not exotic and it's not new and different because it's where I grew up and where I've lived for kind of 90% of my life. And probably this is wrong. And now and again, I get out and do something in my hometown and think, ah, this is quite an interesting interesting place or uh, I should do this more often. And I think probably I really just need to think about it in a different way. And just because I didn't have to get on a plane to get to my hometown doesn't mean that it's not worth seeing. Also looking at her city in a new light is my friend Yea in Serbia, for whom the very act of my asking for hometown travel contributions have caused her to go out and explore a little bit more. Exactly today I walked in the streets where I never walked before in my hometown, which is Belgrade, Serbia. And I felt like a tourist and precisely I thought of you, Ian. I rarely do that. Uh, because there is really not that much more to explore around Belgrade where I haven't been yet. But apparently today I discovered some areas where I've never been before and they were really charming. And I was walking around and looking around and felt, really, I felt like a tourist. <laughs> so probably if you asked me before what I thought on home time travel, I would ask, what home time travel? <laughs> but today I really felt like that and I really loved it. And now I'm thinking of possibly launching myself in some exploration around Belgrade, just going to some remote place I've really never been to. Finally, Laura Lundell has a slightly different take on this, suggesting getting friends to visit you as a great way of you exploring your hometown properly. Hometown travel is most fun when you have a visitor who's never been there before. You might know these streets like the back of your hand, but now you have to imagine seeing them through new eyes. What does your home offer that theirs doesn't? What unique and wonderful things can you show them that you don't even notice because they're just always there? In my home state, for example, everyone smiles and greets each other on the street, and I only really notice this when I have visitors because inevitably they're horrified by having to say hello to a stranger. And I, meanwhile, will greet everyone back extra excitedly because it's on my radar that this is something we do. And then once the visitors left, that magic of seeing everything through new eyes, it lingers. So what about my hometown? What about where I live? Well, there's not a lot to it, really. There's a supermarket and a railway station. The high street is mainly hairdressers, state agents and charity shops. It's just your typical tourist-free post-industrial town where people live. Like everywhere, it's got a history of its own, famous people, a reason to be. But it'll never be in the guidebooks. It's a small ex-mining town in the East Midlands of England. As I say, it used to be a centre for coal and railways until the 1980s. The whole area where I live now would have been throbbing with power, noisy with machinery and train working, smoky with steam engine and coal dust, part of the work-intensive heart of industrial England. Villages and towns sprung up all over to serve these mines and the associated industries. Victorian brick-built terraced houses appear seemingly out of nowhere, at first hidden from view amongst the small grassy hills, and these days often quite distinct from any other indicator of civilization, but which, when built, were next to a mine, a railway, a canal, a processing factory, true one-industry villages. While coal and rail were the most obviously seen industries, the area saw a plethora of manufacturing. Nearby Sutton in Ashfield was a hub for, of all things, hosiery, Pretty Polly were based there before moving to Belper in Derbyshire in the early 2000s, whilst nearby Hucknall had an airfield with a Rolls-Royce engine test centre and was the site of very early work into vertical takeoff and landing planes. There was, until recently, a pub in Hucknall called the Flying Bedstead, named after the original test plane. As far as I'm aware, it's now a small co-op supermarket. The main trouble around here is that nothing's really replaced it in terms of industry. This is very much the post-industrial wasteland, forgotten mining villages and dodgy overspill council estates, the biggest industries being call centres, as at the old Manvers coking plant in Wathapon Dern in South Yorkshire, 
or related administrative buildings filled by large companies taking advantage of cheaper rates. Uh, for example, in nearby Nottingham, the old Cinder Hill Colliery is now Phoenix Park, a business estate primarily occupied by energy company E.ON. Most of the old pit villages have memorials to what was there before, usually a stylized mining wheel, representing the wheel at the top of the headstocks that dominated the landscape and became an iconic symbol of the mining industry. In terms of the community, for many years after closure there was no real replacement work. Many of the areas around Ashfield now rank high up in governmental indices for benefit claimants, long-term sick and child poverty. Some old mines, for example Annesley, have been turned into housing. Others, like Silver Hill, into landscape parkland, but many more stand idle, fenced off edifices crumbling over time, partly demolished, partly just left to ruin, when nobody knows what to do with them. Some headstocks have been purposefully saved as reminders, like at Brinsley, but others just stand, forgotten, waiting for the end of shift whistle that will never come, like in Clipston. The slag heaps have become country parks, the site of the mine buildings and our small business parks are housing estates. Very important to get a mining survey before buying a house here. It's only those rollers of distinctive cottages and the occasional road name that hint at this history. Apart from this industrial heritage, though, you might wonder what else is around here that makes the area notable, or at least worth blogging about. Because I'm not really selling it so far, am I? But remember, everywhere is interesting if you look hard enough. So let's start with sport. Apart from the gold post box commemorating Oliver Hines' gold medal in swimming at the 2012 Paralympics, 200 metres individual medley, my town's most famous sporting figure is the cricketer Harold Larwood whose statue stands in the centre of town, at one end of a recreated cricket pitch outside the main supermarket. Cricketing aficionados may be interested to observe the way his position means he's about to bowl a humongously bad no ball. He was a cricketer in the 20s and 30s, a fast bowler in the days when fast meant low order batsmen were genuinely frightened at the crease. Although lacking accurate technology, it's been inferred from analysing film footage that he could regularly bowl the ball a shade below 100 miles an hour, making him potentially one of the fastest bowlers ever. In addition, he hit his peak at precisely the wrong moment. His abilities meant he fitted in perfectly in the strategy for England's cricket tour of Australia in 1932-33, the so-called Bodyline Test Series. The Crick Info website describes it as the never-to-be-allowed-to-be-forgotten series where the English bowling was aimed directly at the Australian batsmen's legs rather than their bats. England won, the diplomatic fallout from the series almost reached government levels, and Larwood never played for England again, despite becoming an even better bowler later in the 30s. He was born in the mining area of Nunkergate and started out working in one of the local coal mines, apparently leading and guiding the pit ponies who transported the coal from underground to the surface. This work at an early age, he would have been around 12, 13 years old, obviously meant developing upper body strength, especially in the arms, which served his future cricketing career well. Ironically, long after retirement, he emigrated to Australia and was surprisingly well received, better than he was received in Britain. From nearby Hucknall, a century earlier, came another notorious sporting figure, Ben Cornt. He was one of the leading boxers of the early Victorian era, boxing in those days being bare knuckle and with no prescribed time limits ending when one boxer was knocked out. Boxing was a popular event amongst local communities, fostering local rivalries. Ben fought Nottingham-based William Bendigo Thompson three times, on all three occasions the actual fight ended with both sides' supporters doing battle with each other, and the sport obviously lent itself well in an area of hard manual labour. Ben Corned himself was so famous that it's believed the iconic symbol of London, and by inference of the UK as a whole, the sound of the bell inside the Houses of Parliament is named after him. As a fighter, his name was Big Ben, due to his size. He would these days have been considered heavyweight class, or super heavyweight if he were a modern amateur competitor. And due to his fame, the epithet Big Ben was commonly given at the time to similar large examples of a certain type. Owing to the fact the bell cast of Parliament was pretty large compared to, say, a church bell, the nickname stuck. Now, Ben Corn's grave is at St Mary Magdalene Church in Hucknall, but he's not the most famous person buried there. That honour goes to George Gordon Byron, the sixth Baron Byron, whose ancestral home was nearby Newstead Abbey, built in 300 acres of Parkland and itself was originally a 12th century monastery. Ah, Byron, that name rings a bell. Yes, I'm talking about the Georgian-era poet, revolutionary, politician, womanizer, gambler, Lord Byron. Famed for being mad, bad and dangerous to know, he was a very complex character. 
a skilled wordsmith, a revolutionary hero in Greece, though in fact he didn't actually do anything to aid their cause. It was more because, as a well-known figure, he promoted the cause to a wider audience. Sort of like how Ewan McGregor talks about the lack of water in African villages. He had to sell off Newstead Abbey to pay for his gambling debts. He was also particularly bad at relationships, partly due to low self-esteem, but also down to the fact that he seems to have very easily become smitten with people, regardless of his current status. He'd have made excellent viewing on Love Island or Geordie Shore, though that's not necessarily a good thing for him. He did have a daughter, though, buried in the same church, who is arguably even more important to history. Ada Lovelace is generally considered to be the world's first computer programmer, and there's even a computer programming language named after her. It's called Ada. She worked closely with Charles Babbage on his analytical engine, and is believed to have written the first algorithm for it. By all accounts, he was content with just getting it to count stuff, whereas she saw the potential in it to help with more complicated analytics. So he concentrated on numbers. She made him see that those numbers themselves could be used to represent other concepts. And by converting, say, instructions into numbers, you could make the machine do things rather than just being a calculator. Another church with an interesting backstory is in nearby Selston, a sprawling series of roads that cover quite a wide area, but with quite a bit of farmland remaining between them. In the churchyard of St. Helen's Church is buried a chap called Dan Boswell, whose grave states he died in 1827 aged 90, which is quite impressive for that era, and is recorded as, quote, Gypsy King, unquote. Now, for several centuries, the Boswell family were one of the most important in the Gypsy Traveller community, and although with a national reach, seem to have been generally based in the North Midlands, Lincolnshire, South Yorkshire, and especially Nottinghamshire. How much power and influence the King of the Gypsies actually wielded is subject to debate, but several other Boswells had been given this honorific. Also in the churchyard is a small stone menhir, proving the site of the church had been used for worship since pre-Christian times. Interestingly, Christian worship has been practised here since Dane law, so that's pre-Norman conquest, the sort of 7 800 AD, so it's not an unlikely leap of logic. What that basically means is that this is one of the oldest surviving religious places in the region. A third church in the area shows what can be discovered if you look hard enough. Annesley Old Church, dedicated to all saints, is in nearby Annesley, obviously, just off the main dual carriageway headed to the motorway. It's set back off the road a bit behind a roughly built wall up a slight hill. It's just far enough away for it to feel quite undisturbed. It's an oasis of calm near a myriad of frustrated office workers. Indeed, thousands of commuters rush past it every day, probably unaware that it even exists. It's a designated ancient monument and has Grade 1 listed status, the highest accolade for old and important buildings in the UK. Not that there's much left to see in all honesty, an overgrown churchyard with graves burly upright, engravings long since faded, surrounding a shell of ancient stone, redundant, roofless, ruined. Although now preserved and made safe to visit, with defined access routes and information boards, it's possibly a little too late for this small church. It wasn't always thus. A church has been on this site since the Norman Conquest, and this particular structure was erected as long ago as the mid-14th century to serve the local villages of Annesley and Felly. Indeed, the parish still goes by that name, despite Felly not really existing anymore. It's got about three people in it. It served as the main village church until the mid-19th century, when rapid population growth in Annesley, caused because of coal mining, meant a bigger and more central church needed to be built. Nowadays, it's only congregation of bees, it's only visitors, historians, local dog walkers, and curious travel bloggers. Now... Slightly further out, but still an easy ride for me, is a most unexpected spot, and one which you'd feel should be a more bigger attraction than it is. It's the village of Cresswell in Derbyshire, and it, Cresswell itself is a, it's another ex-mining village, and partly notable for its model village, that is, a village built to particular specifications, not a small model of a village. It was a purpose-built village for workers of nearby coal mines in a similar style to places like New Lanark and Salter, but on a much smaller scale. But Cresswell's main claim to fame is Cresswell Crags, a small limestone gorge dotted with caves that have been used by humans for 60,000 years, making it amongst the oldest known habited places in the UK. Obviously, nobody lives there anymore, as far as I know. Each of the caves have been the location of a number of interesting finds, from flint tools and worked animal bones, to some ancient cave art, dating to just under 13,000 years ago, and the most northerly in Europe, as well as being one of the very few examples found in the UK at all. 
The area was a place to shelter from the weather during the Ice Age, as well as providing a watering hole for reindeer and bison, so it was a logical place to set up camp. In one, the wonderfully named Mother Grundy's Parlour Cave, a 50,000-year-old hand axe was found in the 1920s. One of the caves is known as Robin Hood's Cave. While, of course, there's no evidence that Robin Hood existed, never mind stayed here, it's certainly well within the area of his alleged activities, so the idea that he and his band could have hidden in the caves from the King's soldiers isn't too much of a leap of faith, and the idea of such is certainly present in some of the early stories from the 14 to the 1600s. You can visit the caves on a tour, but most of the time they're gated off. You can still peer through the gates, though, and imagine how it must have felt to be inside them. Although small, it's a pleasant place to have a wander around. The site is free and open to the public. There's a visitor centre and small museum on site that do charge, as is parking, as well as a shop and cafe, but it's definitely an interesting place to spend an hour or so, if it wasn't such a bugger to get to. In the modern age, however, my district of Ashfield's biggest claim to fame, and I use the term quite wrongly, is probably that Sutton in Ashfield is believed to be home to Europe's largest sundial. It's a sundial in Sutton. Pointless, and badly designed since the shadow of nearby shops casts a shadow on it so you can't see it anyway. Probably not something for Lonely Planet to worry about mentioning. But see, this is the real UK. This isn't picture postcard cottages, ruined castles on hillsides, village greens or magnificent country houses. This is all those places you see on the map and go, I wonder what these places look like, I've never heard of them before. This is where the signposts you whiz by at 50 on the main road to direct you to. And it is sometimes quite amazing to learn the sort of things that exist in what on the map seems to be a cultural and economic wasteland. And now it's time for lesser known destination of the week. I wasn't sure where to go with this one, whether I should do my nearby city of Nottingham. But instead I've gone for somewhere closer by that's quite interesting and probably not well known. Lesser known destination of the week. A little way to the west of Newark lies Southwell, or Southall, depends where you come from. Now this is a small town of about 7,000 people in Nottinghamshire, quite affluent, private school, notable choir, cafes, local butchers, no supermarkets, and unusually for the area, not dominated by a closed, heavy industry. Having been inhabited since Roman times, there's evidence of a Roman villa, and the major fossway runs fairly close by. Its main claim to fame is it being the location of Southwell Minster, an Anglican cathedral and seat of the local bishop. Minster comes from the same root as monastery and refers to a central hub of religious power run by monks. It's the same sort of building as the much larger and more famous York Minster. There's been at least a church on site since 600 AD, although it became an important powerhouse in the early Norman period, presumably because of its convenient location. Over the years it was upgraded and expanded, An archbishop's palace was built to the south that contained a state chamber room for visiting nobles and dignitaries, including King Charles. Not much of it survives now, only the main hall, one wall, and a latrine tower. These days it serves as the cathedral that marks the centre of the Anglican Diocese of Southwell that covers the Nottinghamshire area. And yes, it's a town, not a city. It's a common misconception that cathedral equals city. In the UK, a city is a town that has been given a charter by the monarch. In the old days, a cathedral was a good way of having a charter. These days, it's more of a competition. Uh, An old pen pal of mine in the early 90s proved that point by scouring her nearest city of Swansea in a knowingly fruitless adventure. Southwell's other claim to fame is that it's home to the original Bramley apple tree, one of the most famous breeds. The uh, technical term is cultivar. I'm so not a nature person at all, so I had to look that up, of apple in the world. It's a very sour apple, so it's not one to eat as a snack. Instead, it's the go-to apple of choice for apple pies, apple crumbles, apple tarts, and has a secondary use in the production of homemade apple wines and other strong alcoholic drinks. The first tree grew from pips planted in the back garden of a house in Southwell in 1809 by a young girl called Mary Brailsford, and both house, Bramley Tree Cottage, and tree still exist today. Some years later, the house was bought by a chap called Matthew Bramley. When someone wanted to buy the apples from the tree for resale in a local shop, Matthew, obviously quite quick-witted with an eye for marketing, agreed, but with the proviso the apples were labelled with his name. This very fact has always been confusion to me, since there are places in the UK called Bramley, and I always assumed the apple came from one of them. But no. Obviously the initial sales were a great success, and entire brand and culture was born. 
Many seedlings and croppings have since been taken over the course of the years, so even if the original tree dies, we won't ever run short of Bramley apples. The town commemorates the apple in many ways. There's an art sculpture of an apple in the grounds of the Minster. The Bramley Apple Inn, a few doors away from the cottage, sells beer and presumably cider and apple wine. And a yearly Bramley Apple Festival in the town with food and drink and entertainment, including dances from the local Morris dancing troupe. Very English, I must say. Well, that's all for this week. Next week's pod should be on a topic that's close to many people's blogs. The Book It List. Until then, have a good week, and if you're feeling off colour, keep on getting better. Thank you for listening to this episode of Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave a review on your podcast site of choice. I'm pretty bad at that sort of thing myself, so I'll understand perfectly if you don't. Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure was written, presented, edited and produced in the Kirkby and Ashfield studio by the Barefoot Backpacker. Music in this episode was Walking Barefoot on Grass, bonus, by Kai Engel, which is available via the Free Music Archive and used under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International Licence. Previous episodes of this podcast will be available on your podcast service of choice, or alternatively, go to my website, barefoot-backpacker.com. If you want to contact me, I live on Twitter at rtwbarefoot, or email me at info at barefoot-backpacker.com. Until next week, have safe journeys. Bye for now.